and here in its home setting is up at the library. Monsieur Black, as he was known in his new life in Monaco, woke in his apartment when the first stripe of golden sun cut into the space not covered by the purple drapes. He climbed up out of his dream, rubbed his eyes and turned over to see if he could steal another few minutes sleep. But that was not necessary. He'd had an early drink-free night. Oh yes, that's right, he had. So he sprang out of the bed, threw the curtains open and casually glanced out at the harbour in the way of a man who had lived here for more than a year. The yachts were still there, safely moored, bobbing a little, as if they too were shaking themselves from out of the dawn and into the day. Sometime since last night, a cruise ship had slid in, taking over a large part of the view from out his window. Beatrice Duffy woke in her apartment in Beausoleil as soon as the sun rose elegantly from the rim of the sea. She took her cup of tea out to the balcony, not wanting to waste one moment of the dazzlement of this, as is the way with visitors who know their time is limited. She was here by the gift of a philanthropic award, offered the chance to dive into the hinted secrets of past literary lives along the Côte d'Azur. She was up at the library every day, trying to include left out people in the story of the place, or sometimes adding interesting things about those who already hovered in history. She felt every moment of her delight. She could be seen from other balconies, touching her heart every now and then, her waking face beaming out to the parts of the ocean she could see between the buildings. Oh look, there was another ship making its way in. Soon enough she went inside, dressed herself for the day and made her way out from her Oudelais apartment to Boulevard du General Leclerc. She spent a few moments thinking of his military history before letting herself be seduced into contentment by the perfectly warm morning the smell of the bakery, the chatter of the market outside Palais Josephine. Beatrice spent a lot of time in the past and sometimes had to remind herself to get on up here. Today was waiting too. Here she was in Beausoleil, walking on the beaming circles chiselled into the pavements, reflections of faces radiant in the sun. She walked on down Avenue de Monte Carlo, having passed the casino and the Hotel de Paris, keeping her eyes trained for the gradual, full appearance of the blue sea. The yachts were still there, safely moored, bobbing a little, well into the morning now, with men and women scurrying about them, polishing. She would take the bus at the next stop, get to the library and have her day assembled before the hour was out. Maurice Vale woke in his hotel, a stone's throw from Place d'Arme. He pulled back the curtains, glimpsing the settling in of office workers in the high building opposite him. It's possible that sight of the sea could have been got from this window, maybe even as recently as a year ago, but the absence of it didn't bother Maurice. He hurried out to get himself a seat in the square under the perfectly glowing sun. He listened vaguely to the excited, well alive shouts of the market men and women. You could be in a tune, he thought, but then he would, being well buried in song names at the moment. Bonjour, monsieur. Café en croissant. He too was up at the library cajoling a song collection into shape. The waiter came back in a flash. Bon appétit. Yesterday a visitor to the library had told him the upper classes did not give that greeting. He wondered about that for a moment. Information received when travelling was not always true, but could still be welcome for all that. Maurice opened his book. A few pages would go well with this perfection. 
he was reading Why Birds Sing. He could have missed the sound of a lark above the morning clatter, but there it was. Yes, he could hear it. Surely that was a lark. Its call rising above the sound of the shouting marketeers. He would walk up the hill and take a look down towards the sea, get a jolt of pleasure before getting down to his task. He took the steps, slowly thinking about what he would do today, then turned at the bend in the road to look down on the beautiful expanse. The yachts were still there, safely moored, bobbing a little, he presumed, although he couldn't be absolutely sure from this distance. He could see a cruise ship and wondered for a moment what a life with little to do would be like. As he reached the library, he heard the voices of school children shouting out in that delighted way they do. The doorbell chimed to his press and in he went. He spent some moments exchanging cheerful morning talk with Juliet, who had already opened the library gay, set it up for its intended events. Maurice laid out the song sheets again, this time for thematic arrangement, having already placed them in alphabetical order. As soon as he had that done, he peered around the door to see Beatrice, the other Irish scholar, whose eyes by now had dropped into their engaged, distant look. Maurice and she had crossed collegial paths before in Dublin, but here they were keeping a certain distance so far. They knew how to be strangers, acknowledging each other's climb up the word count of what it was they had set themselves for this week. And when that began to be achieved, they would know by unspoken signs when to loosen their privacies. Good morning. Good morning. Nice walk in. Lovely. Beautiful day. And what about the sea and the boats? They could have kept going with superlatives, marvelled all day about the surroundings, but they stopped themselves. They had work to do, thoughts to organise, words to be put together, meanings to be said, so that others could add them to what they knew. There was always more to be learned. Where are you at now? Beatrice asked. I'm at another beginning, I'm afraid, but I know what it is, so that's something, I suppose. What about yourself? I'm listing the writers who came and their dates, imagining who might have met whom. I'm trying to figure out the times after the wars who came then, and getting a picture of the terrible things they had to set about forgetting. Really, I want to imagine that the Fitzgeralds crossed with the Kellys in America, but that's another day's work. They smiled at each other, both knowing where days like that could end up. Beatrice had read Frank O'Connor's Guests of the Nation when she was 13, and so had found out that life was not as uncomplicated as everyone had pretended so far. Great, better get on with it then. And they both set about doing just that. Beatrice took up her pen to start something. She had a plan to put order on her long essay, if that is what it was. She had a secure publishing place for it, which gave her free rein to let her mind tinker. She had already made her way to the Hotel du Cap Eden Rock in Antibes. She had needed to see the sweep of the beach, the rug that it had created for all the fun. From the street, she thought it looked like a bruiser of a building, well fit to house the endless luxuries that had taken place within. She didn't take the tour, but waited under the palms, looked out to the sea, walked back to Joanne Le Pan, humming, where do you go to my lovely when you're alone in your bed. The song fitted sweetly. When the sun began to settle, she made her way inside. She bought a long beer and listened as the people at the next table talked about their tour, what they'd heard of the writers' lives and what it put them in mind of. 
They were interested in the stardom of it, the parties. These were not the main things that Beatrice cared about, but they added serious frivolity to her facts, rounding them into more honest reality. She twisted a bit of her brown hair around her ear, bit her lip and thought she should check if Sartre, de Beauvoir or Camus were nearby when Scott and Zelda were here. Scott and Zelda before dissolution. And probably for that reason she suddenly remembered her own given up marriage in her left behind past. In the end it had faded out with as much tight-lipped civility as could be expected, at least in comparison to some. She remembered the evening it was over. They were on a short holiday. The sun was dropping, streaking the sky with colours. Silence was gathering itself together. See you later, they heard a woman shout as she closed the gate, the sound carrying up the silent hill. Even without love being added, the light skip in the words pierced Beatrice right through. Some days she was full of longing. We could go down and see the neighbours, her husband said, knowing what she was thinking, having a terrible fear that this house was going to close around their throats and choke them. There was no possibility at all of driving anywhere. Even the most foolhardy would not attempt that hill after dark. What neighbours? Surely no one lives here after September. They could both feel the melancholy drown them, but that had been then. This was now. She would not sink into that hole again. She brought herself back to the present. She made her way, at a pleasant pace, back to Beausoleil. Who could not love the address? On the Thursday morning, as Beatrice crossed the road by the school, she realised, with satisfied delight, that it was only her fourth day. As the sun had gone yellow over the sea this morning, it had seemed like her seventh. The thin lift brought her to the library door. The bell sounded out among the books. She entered. Bonjour, she called cheerfully. Good morning, Juliet replied. She waved, lifting her eyes for a moment from her task. She was hand-stitching the next library problem delicately sewing it with silk thread. It looked like a dusk task, a job to be done as the birds came in to roost, a job that would give any passer-by puzzled pleasure. Maurice straightened his yellow tie before reaching out to pick up the next bundle of songs. He had got as far as I yesterday. I'll take you home again, Kathleen. He glanced at the names trying not to get distracted by what some of them brought to mind. At lunchtime he must go out to the winding streets of the old town, down to the shop near the palace. He had people to buy gifts for, and they bought back for him. He tugged at his tie again. He placed the packets he had already sorted on the table below the picture of Grace Kelly. During the working day, that was her name, the keeper of these rooms. The evening events returned Princess Grace to her. Juliet said, you know, that's where Burgess played the piano and handed them invitations to an evening at Madame de Trot's apartment up towards Beausoleil. This will get you away from the books and the songs, she said. The previous Saturday, Monsieur Black had also been asked by Madame de Trot to come see the Aboriginal painting she had bought for a song before she left Australia with her late husband. He had become late while they were here enjoying their wealth, but when he died she'd found that he'd bought a bank in Lichtenstein, one that now had no money in it. And what use was a bank with no money? She had lawyers out looking for where it had gone, but they weren't too hopeful. Still, she had plenty yet, and lots of dreams on her walls. Monsieur Black wasn't sure what constituted a song, and suspected it might be more than that to him. Money was a strange thing at her soirees. 
the inconsequential looking man beside you could be worth a blinding figure, too ridiculous even to say. Monsieur Black was not in that league, hovered below the first rung of it, but he was accepted in this circle for other reasons and no one knew quite what those reasons were. This place was like that. Secrets surrounded people. Questions were carefully put. Madame de Troll placed him in the evening. Did you get to meet the orchestra? He had. That was the thing about here. All sorts of invitations, if you made the effort at all. Then she asked, tentatively, with love in her voice, the dancers. Yes, he had. At the end of the evening, and funny thing, they all smoked, and yet they had the breath for dancing, he said. They're young, Madame de Troll said wistfully. I suppose. One of them was awfully rude to a waiter. I see no necessity for that, no matter how famous a person is. I pulled him up on it, but he told me he was a dancer, had no brains, just feet. I said that it didn't take brains to have manners, but I was on a hiding to nothing. His silence seeped out around him. A man, unknown to Monsieur Black, muttered, you said that to a dancer from the Paris Opera, who had just performed in Giselle. It was hard to know what tone he was aiming for. How kind of you, Madame de Troyes said, hesitating for just a second, before moving to welcome a woman dressed in an azure outfit, made to go with the entire glittering coast all the way from Hier to Menton. Monsieur Black turned away and walked to the back of the room. He shouldn't have mentioned the waiter, who in this room cared about waiters? A woman smiled at him, but got back to her conversation without giving him a second glance. Well, she said, I found out the meaning of nostalgia. I should say what it signifies rather than what it means. Nostos, return home, algia, longing. Someone is writing a book about the future of nostalgia. I'd like to edit that, Beatrice laughed. There's healthy nostalgia, bittersweet empathy, and then there's the dangerous one, Maurice replied. So your songs are bittersweet empathy. Well, they're about longing and loss, I suppose, trying to remember as best they can. Every singer, every sing song would add another layer. I imagine people buying the sheets, taking them home, learning the notes, getting the tune to match the words. It was a time before television. Learning your song was vital for keeping the spirit going. Whereas what I'm at is trying to create a pasties monument with different strands of what people wrote in other times. Maybe it's a riff. And I keep being stunned by how they recovered from wars. Putting behind them became a way of life. I suppose there's no other way. We only learn that after we've lived disaster. You know that in the 17th century, Swiss doctors believed that nostalgia was a curable disease like the common cold. They thought that opium, leeches and a journey to the Alps would take care of the symptoms. Monsieur Black listened. Now, that was what he needed. Conversation like this. Who on earth were these people? They did not look like anyone else. He made his way closer to Beatrice, but just at that moment, she turned her back to him, hurried to the coat stand, picked up her jacket and slipped out for all the world as if she was making an escape. Maurice followed her. Outside the door, Beatrice sighed, I love that glitz, but I don't want to get waylaid. Next thing you'd know, I'd be in Jimmy's at night. Maurice didn't know what Jimmy's was, but he would find out. He would like to keep up with Beatrice. As soon as the door closed, a voice was heard. They didn't stay long. I know. They're up at the library. She's doing fiction something and he's doing songs something. Monsieur Black left soon afterwards. For some reason, the overheard conversation had unsettled him. He had his own problems with nostalgia. From having been a constant enough man in his twenties, he had turned into a bit of a rake. A new woman every few years, always younger and getting incrementally so, 
putting the cliché on like a well-fitted glove. Friends who still wanted to love him said he was a romantic, in an effort to put a gloss on the fact that really he was a philanderer. When he was finally stung by the loss of real love, he took the gloves off and set out to learn to live by himself. That's what he was doing here, and what a place to do it. But last week, when waiting for his aperitif companions to arrive, he had sat down. He gazed distractedly at the yacht. It was quiet, not much movement of boats. This was not a fishing harbour with the bustle of work shouting its way in and out. There were few people on the decks, mostly workers cleaning, perhaps getting ready for the arrival of owners, perhaps maintaining the glisten for no one at all. And it was then he saw her, a woman dancing on the deck with her young son. He could not hear the music they moved to. He was overcome with sadness for her, even though there may have been no need. Perhaps the sadness was for himself. He walked down the street steps from Madame de Trot's apartment block. On the flat now, he began his distracted walk home, checking with himself as if he had to pass over the Boulevard du Jardin Exotique. It was then that he saw Beatrice and Maurice. They must have stopped for a coffee somewhere. He was suddenly overcome with the desire to follow them, to hear what they were saying. There was no harm in that. He could into step behind them and heard bits and pieces of their pattern talk before branching off to go to his own apartment. The following morning brought a playful sea mist. It rose from the ocean, gradually exposing the boats, then the buildings, before descending again, but leaving chunks of houses riding on its top for all the world as if they sat on thin air. Monsieur Black spent the day doing the things that he usually did, but feeling somehow dissatisfied in a way that was not normal for him. It was coming up to half past four when an idea came to him. He would go up to the library and wait to see if he could catch those two. He took a coffee at the street corner cafe and watched the door of the Fondation building. Finally, he saw them come out, Beatrice first, Maurice after, and without thinking of what it might look like, he meandered over, sidled into their wake and followed as they crossed Avenue de la Quarantine towards La Condamine. He stayed close enough to hear the coming and going of the conversation. So how did you go today? I've come to the point where I'm a bit stuck. You know when you've forgotten the light that was there when you started. Would a glass of something help? It might do. Will we try the waterfront? And they walked all the way down, stopping to look out over the sea. Monsieur Black kept at a discreet distance for this gazing out. When they reached the port, Beatrice said, pointing to Le Botticelli, I like the veranda for a beer, but here is good for a glass of wine. So yes, wine for me. The waiter came, brought them their drinks. Beatrice held hers momentarily up to the sky. Cheers, Slotcha. Mr. Black had taken an empty table and ordered his drink. He faced out, away from them, so they would not notice his face. And you, how are you getting on, Maurice asked. Great day today. Well, at least I learned what I cannot use. You see, you could get overwhelmed by all that is said. But really, what matters is that you go back to one thing they wrote or made. I'm including Eileen Gray's house. It can be too awful to know how some of them lived. I'm trying to forget 